Welcome to episode 71 of The Nero Show. In today's episode... Specialized and Trek have launched a range of new mid-tier products. We pick through them. Silka release a product that has even me considering going the full wax situation. Vivera release a new set of SPD mountain bike power meter pedals. And VC Adventures risks life and limb in Bolivia. All right, let's get into it. February seems to be equipment month. Jesse, a few drops that you wanted to have a quick yeah. chat about. Shoes, helmets, all kinds of things. What are we talking about? Heaps actually released recently. It seems like the the big tech, the big releases, save that to Tour de France, the Juro, all that sort of thing. Uh, and then February seems to be the trickle in of the trickle down tech for the mid tier, for us mid tierers that live in the middle. Uh, there's a lot going on here. First one, specialized. I'm, I'm very hyped about these releases. So they've released new shoes and new helmets. Let's start off with the helmets. The new one here, the Prepero 4. I know that's uh, Propel Aeroad, sort of a mixed in name there, but we'll, we'll leave the name aside. This is a really competitive mid tier yeah, helmet is, by isn't the looks it? of things. So for those that aren't aware of the Specialized range, they had two main helmets previously, the S-Works Prevail, which is their hot weather vented climbing helmet. Then they had the S-Works Vade, most of you all know, it's their Aero Road helmet. So the Prepero 4, they've split the difference. They've done a essentially a do-it-all helmet, and they've done it at a specialized level, so a non-S-Works level, so they've cut the price. So if you're in Australia, the S-Works Prevail or the S-Works Vade with both 425 Australian dollars, the Prepero is a very competitive in the helmet market, $300. Yeah, right. Um, for, a, for a latest version 2024 edition, I think that's really competitive. Some of their claims, um, what are we looking at? They say it's four watts faster than the Prevail, the vented version, which is doesn't surprise me given just the look and the, and the shape of it. Um, four watts, if you're racing, sure, why not to save a couple of watts on your helmet at 45K an hour? I think that's nice to have. Uh, it is a little bit heavier than the, the, the S-Works versions. So the, the Evade in the medium is about 270 grams. The Prevail was 260. Uh, the Prepero, now depending on what country you're buying it in, it, it does change the specs. It's between 290 and 310. So it is a, around 50 grams heavier than the S-Works models. Uh, but it's not too bad because it does come with MIPS as well. There are lighter helmets on the market. So the helmet that we ride, the HJC Furion, is about the same price, $300, but it doesn't have MIPS. Um, and it comes in about 50 grams lighter. So it's heavier, th this new Prepero, but it is, uh, well, it's a specialized product. So you've got that and it's got MIPS. It's interesting you mentioned, I'm actually just looking at some of the shots of the guys riding it on the specialized website and it has a really similar kind of ventilation type system to what the HJC one that we run has. Very similar kind of profile look to it. I noticed... My only sort of gripe with that HJC ones can often be very difficult to get your sunglasses in there. This seems to have some sort of sunglass retention system built into it, which is which is kind of cool. Yeah, cool cool to see a sort of mid. Well, yeah, I suppose we have to call three hundred dollars mid tier these days. I mean, there's always people going to say it's expensive. It's 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 2024. It's 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 it's, it's inflation prices. So, I mean, as that sits in the market, that's a competitive product that has legitimate trickle down. As much as people like to hate on that word, it, I mean it's true in here, and uh, it's competitively priced. I, I will say the looks of it, and I've always said this about the Evade, it just is too big and chunky for a lot of riders, especially if you're one of those people in between sizes and you're on the lower end of the larger size yep. for your range. I mean, this new Prepero Four doesn't fix that. No. And some of the models they're running, it looks a bit chunky, but you know, that's. Personal preference, i got to give Specialized credit for this. I think this is a very competitive uh, release. Right, so Trek have dropped their RSL Knit Road Cycling shoes. These are not mid-tier, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> no. These are certainly not mid-tier. Uh, I don't know, that the whole flyweight sort of thing, I, I know you haven't really run these. I, I've sort of tried them in the past. These uh, lean a long way into that. No two ways about it. Um, they're not for everyone, absolutely. But the, the I suppose the design part that really interests me is that heel retention, well, attempt at a heel retention system and the, the front of the foot thing because anyone that's ridden these fabric-based shoes will always say that they just feel like there is no 
closure to it. It, it's, it feels like you're riding in socks. And for a lot of cyclists, including me, that's not really the feeling that you necessarily want from your shoes. You want a bit of, yeah, a bit of stiffness mm. down there. Yep. Um, and that, <laughs> that yeah. <laughs> well, there's a reel. It's always um, nice. <laughs> and well, um, well that obviously the heel system, they've tried to reinforce it. Um, they've even changed the color of it to kind of make it even look like it's, it's even more reinforced. Um, it was probably only a matter of time before Trek go into the fabric thing. It was one of the elements that was missing from their whole line of shoes. Uh, apart from that, to the two boa system, I know a lot of people don't like the aesthetic of that, but. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, fr from a comfort point of view, you got to have two, well, two boas or two sites that the shoe's tightening up over. Any shoes that attempt to have one. Oh, the bont, the bonds that I use that have one boa, they actually know they made it work. But generally, the, the two boas is is better from a comfort point of view. Yeah, with, see, with the fabric ones, this is where you can kind of play around with that stuff because you can you can try and get, you know, you don't have the stiffness issues that you would have from a, a normal shoe. And that was always the, the issue I had with the bont shoes on top is that they were so ski boot stiff mm -hmm. that you would get sort of that feeling. I had that with the Shimano shoes as well, that you – that over the top of the foot, it was just too much. And that was one of the reasons I went to the fabric shoes in the first place because, like, the bridge top of my foot would get sort of – would hurt, basically. And the fabric shoe, you could lay off that a bit. So okay. I'm surprised they went for the for the two boas. But, look, they look sick. They look super cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably got to add it to the to their lineup. Not by any stretch of the imagination mid-tier, but, yeah. It's a – yeah, it's, it's nice a new release. It. Try something slightly different for those that have the cash and want to do something different. Cool. I do think the gold and black colorway, I mean, <laughs> it looks sick. Like, there's no two ways about that. Do you see many – I noticed these are branded Trek. I, I thought Trek called their shoes Bontrager they shoes. Did. They used to. Yep, yeah. 100%. Uh, what's going on there? I, yeah, anyway. They did that with the ballista helmet. The latest version of the Ballista is now the Trek Ballista, not the Bontrager Ballista. All right. So that's a branding decision, which I, I actually like. I yeah. think it makes sense. Uh, keep. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you if Trek has a good name in the in the market, so put that on. I think that's a good decision. I was talking to an industry head during the week, and they mentioned to me because uh, I, I haven't seen many Trek slash Bontrager shoes. I mean, I think I only know one person, Dan, who rides them. Uh, but these are like, it's a huge part of their business, the, the shoe and helmet part. I didn't realize, but Trek and Specialized, it's a massive, massive part of their business. They've also released uh, th their mid-tier and lower level shoes. So basically Specialized and Trek, it appears in the last week, have released all their new shoes. And so they are very comparable now because you can compare prices and specs. So I'm going to go back from Trek. I'm going to go Specialized. Because again, another another one I'm big on. I think this is really competitive. They've released two new shoes: the Torch 2.0, which is their cheaper ones, and the 3.0, which is their mid-tier shoe. What can I say? The Torch 3.0 Road shoes. We're going to compare this to the S Works ones. The S Works ones are 650 Aussie. These new ones are 380. And in the shoe world, 380 is competitive. That is any of the top tier shoes now are. are usually 450 plus so it, it is mid-tier and just looking at these side by side it's the full carbon sole it's not a carbon um fiberglass composite thing it's pure carbon sole it's dual blowers that look to be in pretty much the same spot as the s-works version and a relatively thin kind of seamless upper which looks similar to the s-works now the s-works shoes for years in the racing community have been very well respected. I know when we were on teams, there were guys that always just wanted to run the S-Works shoes because they just work really well. They're really comfortable. So if this is leveraging the S-Works shoe comfort, stiffness, and all of that, that's going to be a killer shoe. So again, the the the, the 2.0s, that's the cheaper ones. They've replaced one of the bowls for Velcro. It looks a bit chunkier sort of around the side. So... I think if you're, if you're a racer, you're probably going to want a mid-tissue, and I think that Torch 3.0. Can I do something? Can I play one of the questions that we got from the subscribers? Um, yeah, I'm going to play it now, and let's 
let's have a quick chat about this. What's up, Chris and Jesse? Ico from Brazil here. So my question is, what do you guys look for when uh, buying uh, cycling shoes? Do you always go for the stiff one? And if so, have you ever experienced any kind of soreness for using stiff shoes on long rides? Like Grand Fondo and all that. Do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, let me let me take it because I've um, I've used quite a different shoe when I quite a different number of cycling shoes across the range. Because when I started in university, I didn't have five hundred dollars to spare on shoes, so buying the top tier ones was not even an option. Unfortunately, with shoes, I found the more you pay, the more comfortable they are. It, I haven't found really those back in the day the the budget shoes or the mid level ones were never as good. It wasn't until I bought a pair of Bonts, the top level ones, that I was comfortable. And ever since then, I've gone from Bonts, the top level ones, they were good. The the Shimano shoes, they were a bit too narrow for me, so I wasn't a fan of them. I thought they had a bit too much padding. Now I'm on the Rafa top level expensive shoes and they are perfect for me. So for me, yeah, stiffness, you want the stiffest shoes possible. That's best for power tr- for, for, for power. Pa- but power transfer and comfort and that feeling of connectedness in the pedal stroke, I like the stiffest sole possible. And then it's just a matter of getting an upper that isn't putting pressure on your foot. But that's that's where I think a lot of people go wrong. My answer to the question, which was essentially, can should you just buy the stiffest shoe you can afford? My answer is no, because stiffness, I mean, the stiffness of the sole of the shoe. That's what I'm absolutely, talking about, the stiffness yes. of the sole. And yes. there, I, I, I'll Try and dig out this website where the guy was rating the stiffness of stiffness of the stole, soles of shoes. And he, ultimately, once you started getting to a certain grade of carbon, which pretty much all of them ran, they were all as stiff as everything else. From there on in, it all came down to comfort and the comfort of the upper and the shape of the the shape of the shoe. And my answer was going to be yes. I've wasted a lot of money on lots of premium shoes, and I've been in absolute agony in. $700 shoes. And I've also been in sort of, well, now that I've been running a shoe that fits me, I've no need to ever change it. A similar priced shoe. So unfortunately, yes, stiffness of the soul matters, but from then on, unless you can pigeonhole yourself and you can really work out, right, I have a fat foot. Okay. I have a top bridge of my foot that does this. And I know that brand's going to work for it. Sadly, Trying shoes on and riding them is, well, even if you can just try them on in a in a shop. And I know that's why Trek and Specialized shoes sell so well is because they tend to be the shoes that you're able to try on in a Trek slash Specialized branded store. Agree, agree with all that. I will say as well, just to be really vain, the more expensive shoes look better. I mean, oh, yeah. I can. Sorry, of course. Someone's riding along. Oh, this is gonna get whatever. I don't care. You can spot mid-tier shoes or, or lower-level shoes from the major brands. And, and the, the top-level shoes are th- generally thinner in the upper but still as comfortable and sleeker-looking. They have a nicer cut around the ankle, and they look better. And the, really, shoes as well, especially if you don't buy white ones that just get trashed. I've been on Rafa shoes for three, the same pairs for three. I, I bought two, uh, two pairs, and I cycle through them, and I've been on them for three years. So to me, shoes are an investment. Just get the, if you can afford it, get the expensive ones that work for your feet and just ride them for years and they look nice. Uh, yeah, I'm not a, uh, of all the things that I will go value option on, the sh- for me, shoes is the, the most important to get right. What's the, what's the most important part of the vanity of the shoe? Is it, is it when you're on the bike and you look down and see your feet, you want, <laughs> you don't want the fat foot feeling? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. There sh- I don't I want to like bon- name and shame a shoe because there was one that was like that that I pretty much moved off off because every time I looked down I just thought I don't like the look of these shoes and you're look like that's every ride you look down you want to look at something I mean I want to look at a nice looking shoe so I, I did go off those and there there are people normally people with tanned bronzed tanned legs who can kind of get away with any shoe um, like those treks that we just showed with the high. Uh, that high heel, I would look ridiculous in those because I've got little short legs. <laughs> it would just look 
like I'm running a gumboot. Like I don't want that look when I look down. I'm not going to go that route. I want a low, a really low profile shoe to make my legs look bigger. I love that we've now just gone, gone down should, this route. Yeah, in terms of the longevity, mm. I mean, if you're oh, gotcha. if you buy white ones, you're, you, that's it's a vanity call, fair enough. But if you're buying a, a darker pair that doesn't end up looking trashed, you should be able to get three years out of a shoe. And given that it's between that and the saddle, the most important contact points, I don't feel bad spending 600 bucks on a pair of shoes. If they were comfortable for me, I'd, I, I would do that. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think with the shoes. Um, can I just quickly, that, let's cross compare. Trek and Specialize, their mid-range shoes. I think Specialize have outdone Trek in this release. So uh, the sub-400 Australian dollar shoes, Trek have the Velocis road cycling shoes. I don't think they look as nice as the Torch 3.0s, and the Torch 3.0s are 380. Those, the, the Specialized ones look sleeker, thinner, more high level. Those Trek Velocis ones do look more entry level to my eye. Just what I'm saying about the... The, the profile look of a shoe and the torch 3.0s have them where you see around, um, I don't know what that part of you, the, the ankle is, it cuts really low in there and then it sort of stays. That makes your legs look so much better. <laughs> that does like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't harp on about that, but like, yep. yeah, yeah. Looks cool. Right. That. Uh, I don't think I have much more to add there. That's the new m releases. I'm going to say Trek versus Specialized. I think Trek win, uh, Specialized win win this round, and I think there's some good products in there. Can I just talk a little bit about uh, another release that I saw pop up this week? Mm -hmm. um, the Asioma Pro MX. Okay. So this is their off-road uh, Shimano SPD uh, power meter pedal. So your gravel, mountain bike, pedal, whatever, potentially – not necessarily that interesting. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They're amazing. They work. They're completely bulletproof. I'm sorry, Asioma, but unfortunately your brand at this point, that's just what everyone expects. You are the gold standard. So, you know, I, I kind of skipped through Shane Miller's review of it because I'm like, yeah, they're going to be perfect, <laughs> yeah. like, whatever. Yep. But the, the thing that was interesting from my perspective, looking at what they've done here is – it's actually their own pedal body. So as opposed okay. to the previous Asiomas, I think it's the ones that you still run. Yep. So that's a that's a proprietary, well, it's a it's a third party pedal body. They've actually developed the whole thing in house. The other thing, if you look, have you have you got them there on your screen? Yep. What's the one thing, the big difference from what you see there to the ones you run? Uh, the spindle looked a lot, didn't have that chunky bit around the spindle. There's no pod. Yeah. There's no pod. Yeah. It's a lot slicker. That to me is like, whoa, okay. Um, imagine a no pod. I mean, I know, I think SRM have just released something of a no pod version, but a no pod pedal power meter that just looks like your pedals. Now we're in the, the sort of situation of complete, hate to overuse the word, but game changer sort of position. You reckon? What's the – that? so for me, that pod never got in the way of the look style pleats that I use on the regular Favero. The, I, from my end, the problem was always the Shimano ones and you had the extended Q factor mm. and people didn't like having their legs wider. So that was a consideration for that. So this uh, would fix that yes. um, for the Shimano ones. Yeah. Um, I personally never minded the pod for the look star ones because it, it didn't actually change the spacing of the uh, of the pedals. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know how they've – there's a lot of stuff in that little yep. spindle. Yep. If the battery life is the same, I mean, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Can, I got a power meter, I got a power meter tangent. Mm -hmm. I was messaging Jen the other day about something training related and she was talking about how uh, power meters are so – common now it's just like you buy a bike it comes with a power meter uh most people probably if they're getting into road cycling feel pressure to buy a power meter uh do you think that's justified or do you think the power meter buying revolution is is uh is just getting people to spend their money i don't know 
<laughs> I actually, yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever really looked at it from that perspective because when I would, even when we sit down and we talk about value for bikes, I, to me it's, 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 it's a criteria that a value bike must have. You just, I mean, we've talked about yes. this. Yep. We're like, oh, it doesn't come with a power meter. Ugh, don't, don't bother. Uh-huh. And I don't know whether it's it's me with my bias or or, or it's me thinking well you, sh- you it's worth you future proofing yourself mm-hmm. for you know what I'm gonna sign up to train a road next week and do a six week base plan or whatever it might be and oh I've got a power meter I can do that is it kind of overkill for a lot of people I don't know I, I see I see a lot of Groups that that ride around and and the data chat is, I mean they don't sorry but don't really know what they're talking about most of the time but it's still you want to be part of the conversation but then oh, I don't know yeah, yeah. okay I I read the same thing because I I'm similar to the view I you know if the bike comes with a power meter I say that's ama- it's amazing great good value but she kind of questioned me on it I thought oh you know that's true that there, there are I would probably say the majority of people. Riding around with a power meter, either don't really use it at all, or it's used for nothing more than, oh, up Gary last week I did two hundred and sixty watts, and that's that's what it's used for, which is in a way that's not really getting value out of it. So in that case, you know, all, basically all of those cases that they probably would have been better off just buying the bike for cheaper without a power meter, um, and I I just hadn't considered. But I, I still think that even if you aren't training as such if you are wanting to go do an event there's value in it from the the calorie perspective knowing what you're kind of doing maybe maybe not because it's a rough estimation Mm. no no calorie on the power meter but but, uh, from maybe from pacing yeah sort of but is anyone i've spoken to a lot of people most people aren't really doing that um Anyway, something to consider with these, you know, these asiomas come in and the aftermarket power meter options are getting cheaper and very extremely reliable. That something to consider when we're if we're re- talking about a bike and it comes with a power meter, I think we need to check ourselves. It's not ne- necessarily always a good thing that it comes with a power meter. If half the people that buy it never. Okay, I did. I did just quickly on the asioma things. I did watch Peak Talks review of them. I, I watched a bit of Shane Miller's one as well. And both of them talk about, you know, all of these – well, actually, I don't think Peak went into it as much, but the the cycling dynamic stuff, the everything additional to what your power is, data, that your power meter gives you. Are, are, people, getting, are people getting stuck in those weeds? Are people worrying about their Not from pedal what I've efficiency? Seen. No. Not from what I've seen. I've, I've, uh, I very much feel it's a manufacturer – Froth that they can include it, and it's a selling point. Hardly anyone is really seriously analyzing that. Even as a coach, it's not something I look at someone's pedaling dynamics. It, it, we can go down that rabbit hole. It's just not. You can th- you can change your pedaling dynamics just by thinking about oh, pull on the upstroke. Oh, there there we go. Okay, five minutes later, and you're back to what it was. So that's it's being able to see that is just not particularly useful from a training point of view. So, but it's in there. The yeah. SEM one was something like it's where your pedal, the pressure on the pedal is on your cleat, and is it sort of in balance with the rest of your foot? Mm, for a bike stuff. fit, yeah. If you're doing a bike fitter and you getting left right balance and space, you know. But the problem with any of that is you can you can think your way into any pedal dynamics in the moment. So there's, it's it's not like oh I shimmed it and it fixed it. Well, did, was the person just pressing more with the outside of their foot? So yeah. I, I've never really found a use for that. So that's not the end of the new products. However, in this particular situation, you've actually been trying this. I have. And now I think we do have to say as a disclosure, this is an ad. This is the Silka sponsored segment because Silka have released a new product, the Strip Chip, overnight. I'm going to come out and say, because I've don't, been testing it. Don't use it. Don't use the word. I won't use the, G, I won't <laughs> use the GC word. I will just say it's the biggest improvement to my bike maintenance, hands down, in the last five years. People are going, you, what are you guys talking about? Let me 
Talk you through it. It's called the strip chip. All it does is really simple, and that's a good thing. You put it in your pot of wax when you're waxing your chain, and it means when you take your fresh chain out of the packet and it's got all that gunky factory grease on it, pop it in the wax with a strip chip, and it completely degreases the chain all in one go. You're not doing the turpentine. This no is terps, one, okay, right. no diesel, no other degreasing products. This has essentially removed the need for degreasing your chain before using either a, a drip-based wax lube or, or an immersive waxing. I've tested it. I've used it. It works. When they told me about this, I, I, I thought... <laughs> I'm looking through the emails yeah, now. You're like, I, went, what? I thought, okay, this is... I, like, <laughs> It was it's, it was too good to be true. Honest, like honestly, oh, you don't need to degrease your chain anymore. I'm thinking, what? You, how is that even possible? So, I, I I said to Silga, could you send me your system? Yep. That contains the wax, the the strip chip, and then their drip on wax lube. They sent it so I could just test it to see if it worked. And I mean, it does exactly what it says on the packet. You've got it behind you there, if you want to. There it is. That's it. Little magical squares of chocolate. You drip, drop one in the pot of wax. It takes the factory grease off the chain and leaves you with a freshly waxed chain with no factory grease on it. I mean, it, it does exactly what it says. So I do want to chat about this more, which we're going to get into because I got, I got plenty to say about this. But uh, Silk have sponsored this episode. This has been a sponsored segment. So if you want to support the show and try out the strip trip for yourself, uh, there is a link in the bio. Our, or on silka.cc, use code Nero15, you get 15% off your order at Silka and try out the strip chip for yourself. Yep. So, yeah, just, just to reiterate, there'll be a link down below in the description. Also, you can go directly to silka.cc. Make sure you use the code Nero15 in the checkout and you will get 15% off the strip chip. So now I get to go into all the, the details because mm. this thing is seriously – I can't I'll, say enough good about it. So I've got some B-roll, I think, of okay. you Yeah, I've, I've recorded the this. process of yeah. using it. So let me just, for, for those that aren't interested in bike maintenance, I'm sorry, but for those of you that are, you're going to want to hear like how this works. So for, for years, I've, I've been a fan of wax-based lubricants, but I've always used a drip lube. So for those of you that aren't aware, anytime you're using a wax-based lube, you have to get all the factory grease off the chain. Now, the, the factories put this grease on the chain when they put it in the packet so it has good shelf life. The wax, whether you're doing immersive waxing in, in a pot or you're just dripping a wax-based lube on, it will not stick to the chain with the factory grease off. So forever, before this came out, you had to do this degreasing process, which was a pain in the ass, but it was worth it to use a wax-based lubricant. And this involved, for me, it was minimal terps, shake it around, leave it for 24 hours, repeat, then use a methylated spirit over the top to remove the terps. And it was, it was sort of a two-day process to get that chain entirely clean. And then I went on top with, with my drip uh, wax lube. Now, with the strip chip, all I do is turn on the, uh, the slow cooker, put the new chain in, come back in 15 minutes, and the chain is degreased and waxed. It's like a little uh, sort of chip of dark chocolate, yep. isn't it? Yep. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. So I, I feel like there's two people that are, are going to want this. Firstly, if you were already in the immersive waxing world doing this, well, it's a no-brainer because next time you're putting on a fresh chain, it saves you doing the degreasing process. Like you're instantly going to buy this. Why would you degrease if you can just use this? Second, second sort of group of people it'll work for are people like me that could never really be bothered doing the immersive waxing because I always found the drip wax mm -hmm. loops worked fine and then I put up with the degreasing process. But now... Well, I'm moving to immersive waxing because it saves me doing the degreasing. Yep. And that's – so that's saved two days of faffing around with the chain, plus I then get the benefits of the immersive waxing at the end, which is, is better longevity of that, of that wax on there. When you put the – sorry, just quickly on the actual run of it because I'm, I'm, I'm also in that group of people that well, – obviously I had a chain guy – and, but then I would continue to wax the chain post that. But the reason I had the chain guy is because I could never be bothered doing the initial setup, right? Just quickly, so when you put the strip chip thing in, um, how do I describe this? How do you know, how do you know it's worked? <laughs> okay, yeah. A few things. Firstly, 
Unfortunately, I feel this will be the death of the chain guy. Uh. Because what did the chain guy actually do for you? Well, he saved you that annoying degreasing process. That degreasing process doesn't exist anymore. So unfortunately for all you chain guys, Zilker <laughs> pretty much put you out of business. Um, so what was the, the question was, uh, how, how do you know do if you, it worked? Yeah, like yeah. Is, just, do you see the factory grease? No. no. So what this product does, Zilker did a good video on it. It basically, it turns that factory grease into a wax-like structure. So it basically just gets absorbed oh, into I the see. grease. So you'll never know. So the reason, so how do you know if it's worked? Well, firstly, honestly, we're going to have to wait until someone independently tests it to see how does a properly degreased chain compare with a strip chip degreased chain in wax and see if it, it's similar. So we'll have to wait for that independent testing. Uh, well, how do you know if it works? Well, I you can tell because you take the chain out. It's really stiff when you first when it dries off, so you know that that wax is adhered inside the chain. And then also you just look at it after every ride and you can see the wax is still in there. It's sticking. It's performing just like a wax chain. So as far as I can tell, it, it, it works just like a wax chain. And it doesn't – firstly, it doesn't – I thought initially – when I heard about it, I thought, well, if you strip a chain in your pot of wax, it's going to contaminate the pot of wax. Mm. What do you do with that? Well, Silka say that you can get six, uh, s as far as I'm aware, six um, degreasings out of a pot of wax, at which case the amount of kind of, uh, of that grease style that sort of builds up in the wax then contaminates it. But you're not really doing that anyway because you'll do your first degrease and then you're just – using it as a normal pot of wax. And then, you know, maybe after 10,000 K you go and use your new chip. Yep. So that'll last for ages. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can tell you're, you're all about this actually. I, it, yeah. I mean, what Silker have done as well isn't, I have a lot of credit for them because they're not just going, what's the best. So you look at a bike, for example, what does a bike manufacturer do? Well, how can we just make a slightly faster bike than we had before so it sells faster? But what Silker are, are doing is not just going, well, how can we make the best performing hot wax mix stuff? Sure, they can do that. But they've also gone, well, what's limiting people from using it? Well, degreasing the chain is a pain in the ass. And well, how can we fix that? Well, they've invented this. So it's not just producing high performance products that reduce the friction and increase longevity of your chain. It's also making it easier. Uh, I yeah, it's seriously. It's uh, when a product is so good that I don't believe it'll work, and then it works. It's uh, pretty cool. We're still going on New Year. Um, yeah, <laughs> what a week! Uh, what a week! <laughs> what a week! So we, obviously, we knew the fact that new Ostro Van was out. Mm -hmm. um, we started to see some reviews come out, but we also saw them dump their what are we calling it? Like the white paper yep. type thing, mm -hmm. um, and. It was pretty um, – there's some big claims in there. <laughs> yep. So um, not necessarily the, – the a lot of the devil's in the detail with the stuff. Like the, 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 the weight savings of the bike weren't really much to do with the frame. A lot of those weight savings have come from those new black ink wheels. Yep. Um, they've, got, they've got those black ink wheels down to 1,200 grams, still with a pretty wide internal rim width. 60 mil, like my reserve wheels, yeah. which I've said on here, and I, I, I suggest a lot of times when people reach out to me, I like them. They're like 1600 grams or like 15. Okay. They're very similar. Like you look at them mm. pretty similar. That's, that's a lot of difference. And I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's the carbon spokes. I'm not, and they're not hookless. They're no. hooked. Yeah. They've got hooks. Yeah, uh, and they've got that that sort of sh that bell shape that they all mm -hmm. seem to be using now. 23, 23 mil internal. Yep. So they say op they say op so optimized for a twenty eight mil tire. Yeah, I'd, you'd throw a thirty on there happily. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. I just I didn't want to go into detail with it because mm. I, no one's really ridden it. But I just yeah. from a few pure okay. specs perspective, that kind of blew me away. The other one is the aero claims. Now again, can't wait to see. Um, tool magazine stuff on this, obviously, yep. but it's really rare. This has been pointed out to me a few times, but it's really rare for a brand when it's launching its bike to compare its wind tunnel results 
against other brands' bikes. The, the standard practice is we're 10% faster than last year's iteration. We're 5% stiffer than last year's or previous model's iteration. Very rare you see, like we saw in this graph of mm. the SL7, sorry, the SL8, the S5, and the new factor on these Apple-esque at a keynote graphs where, you know, you're not really quite sure what the, the metrics are and the, the data points are, but it's really rare to do it. And I don't know whether I'm mm. – well, I mean, the, the results were very, according to Factor, very good for the, the new Ostrovam. Mm. So it, it's interesting to see because, you know, they've, they've put things in there where they've, they've said like they've tried to use the builds of the different frame, of the different brands and all that kind of stuff. But it's rare to see, so I, I'm I am actually pretty impressed that they're willing to put this stuff out. So, the, so what have they done here? They've got this this chart shows normalized performance. So they've tested it across different your angles, and they've said they've used the same black ink wheels and handlebar across the three bikes. Okay, I mean, so in a straight line, zero degrees of your the S5 is faster, and at the more extreme your angles. The factors faster, and the SL8 doesn't come near either of them. I, I, like again, I don't want to go picking the this <laughs> stuff well, out. Not, I also don't know. I mean, what is what is point zero zero five CDA difference? Mm. I, I I just can't. I'm not knowledgeable enough to interpret this graph. I mean, yeah, the lines faster. That's about <laughs> as much I can say. But. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't – when you look at the frame, I mean, it's not surprising, is it, that it's faster, the head tube's narrower? Yeah, it's probably a good bike. I don't know. Why? <laughs> no, I just, I just, it's, it's just really rare for the brands to do this. That's kind of why I – because it's, it's kind of drummed into me by a lot of industry people saying, oh, brands never compare themselves against other brands. They always just put in the previous ones. So mm. they, they have, but does it actually add value? Does it add – to what we're talking about. But I don't, don't you think the anytime a brand does that, we just say, well, it's their testing. So mm. yeah. it's always grain of salt, even if they've done due diligence to run the testing properly. Yep. It's always a bit grain of salt. But, but if that's just testing they've done just to validate their own frame and wheels, and then they're just sharing it. And what's the, do we have a price yet? Yeah. Some, I think you can buy starts, it. Okay. So if I go, oh, they've got the specs here, Aussie. So if I want Altegra. Okay. I'd slap Altegra on no, this. Yeah, that's, Jesus. That's disgusting. Why would you even? Romano Dura Ace. No surprised power they haven't given you that as a drop down menu. Option. Shram Red with power meter 18,900. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's just under S Works prices. It's not as, this top end buy. I mean, I just don't really, uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> unless I'm just going to sit here and just like, you know, oh, that head tube. I mean, I just don't really. Ah, uh, this top level now. I mean, I it just does, don't, it doesn't really yeah, do my. I just, I yeah, it gets yeah. nauseating. It yeah. does. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I, we've been really good at this. I think for the last month. Well, I suppose I did it when I was at the Tour Down Under, but we've we've tried to hold back a bit on this because it does. It you, you almost feel a bit dirty yeah. talking yeah. about this stuff with like twenty thousand dollar. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you, <laughs> not going to now. Right. Oh, maybe I will. Will I? Okay. I was going to ask you, because we're going to get a new TCR this year. What would a new giant TCR, apart from being $5,000, what, what would it have to do to convince you? Because you are a TCR rider. A, standing in front of me, a TCR rider. You got the tattoo. Okay. It'd have to neck itself. <laughs> I'm sick of the TCR. It doesn't fit. Okay. Five kilos? It's, I mean, it's going to be... No, 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 no. All right. Okay. It is... Mm, the propellers as a race bike is just beating it. So it's not, it can't get more aero. It's, it's done. The Defy is already... The, the frame set weight of the Defy, wasn't it like 700? Like it's already super light. So if they're going the lightweight option of it, maybe it shaves... 50 grams for frame set, 80 grams. Not doing it for me either from a lightweight point of view because the Defy is already quite competitive there. There is no path forward for the TCR 
that I, is going to get me excited. There's almost no... And yeah. I, ho- I hope Giant hold my beer and pull something out because I'm a fan of the TCR. I just don't see it. Well, they've, they've only... They've, we know what it'll be. It'll be... Okay, you can build it. You can build it sub six kilos, and it will be fully internally routed. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's leaked pictures of that. But you're right. Like, yeah, I, 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 I really can't, I can't say. And and the propel, if you're getting the advanced SLs already, what six point nine, seven? Like, I don't, I, I, I can't, I can't see it. But the the thing with the propel though is you you're you're talking about the weight of the absolute top end version mm-hmm. so potentially what you would be able to do if the weight's the big deal is you're able to spec down the tcr a bit and still get it to this magical 6.8 kilos and aero is not a big thing for you maybe that's the market they're going to try and and try and go at i mean there's obviously i mean i i still stand stand by the the idea that the, the defy will already get you there it's mm. just that obviously there's a geometry difference yeah but, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I, this was the problem with the, the Propel going the route that it went because, like, Trek, it's an obvious one. Okay, you don't want the full-out massive Madone? Mm-hmm. Sure. Here's your lightweight climbing bike that you can get down to around 6.8 kilos. Mm-hmm. Totally different. Essentially the same sort of thing with the S5 R5. Yep. Giant have kind of shot themselves in the foot there. Because, yeah. I mean, that same customer is looking at those two bikes going, uh, I don't know, mm-hmm. whichever, it's all good. If the, if the Propel looked like an S5, mm. then there would be a room for that crossover, do it all. But now with the Propel as it is, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it. But we'll see, won't we? As long as it comes out with graphs and lines and your mm-hmm. angles, I'll be happy. Right, so round two of subscriber questions. Uh, BMBM has sent us a audio message, and I'm going to play that for us now. Hey, Chris and Jesse. Thought I'd give this a shot. This is a personal dilemma that I'm having currently. I'm living in the UK, and I'm currently riding a Boardman 9.2 uh, SLR frame. So it's a disc frame, and I have 32s uh, GP5000s on the back and the front end. Recently, I found a deal for £1,500 on a SL7 frame. And um, doing some research on it, I found that my frame is actually slightly bit lighter than the equivalent SL7 frame would be. Um, however, I understand that the geometry is more so aggressive than the Boardman frame that I have because it is an endurance bike. Okay, so essentially mm. BMBM is in a situation where he has the Boardman SLR 9.2 disc. He has an upgrade option to an SL7 from what I gather, he'd be taking his group set over to the SL7. Not sure about the handlebar stem situation, um, which I do think matters in this particular circumstance. Should he do it? Should he hang on to the boardman? Jesse, call your thoughts. Can we? Can you answer this first? No, because I'm going to come out as the dickhead first. No, well, not necessarily. Right. I'm still I'm still stewing on this one. Okay. Well, I I'm so I don't know the size of our mate. And so I'm looking at it, therefore, from my own perspective, my own sizing, and it's the million, it's how long is the piece of string <laughs> question because we don't know what riding he's doing, what the future of his riding is, all that kind of thing. But he is wanting to go further down the route of a bit of racing and, you know, more serious fast-paced group rides getting good Fondo times, the geometry of that Boardman is going to be a challenge for him in terms of certainly aggressive road racing. So there's just the, the standard sort of fit stuff. I mean, if even if he slammed his slammed his stem on the Boardman, he's still – it's it's essentially like eight mils higher mm-hmm. than, than the specialist. So you're going to reach a point – where it's, again, don't know the, the the riding capabilities of the guy, but you are going to reach a point where you're going to need to do something else about it. And the other one thing before I hand it over to you is, so looking at a 54, it's a 15 mil shorter wheelbase on the Specialized. That's going to really change the way that bike feels. 
I know yep. it's super cliche, but he would get on that SL7 and he would go, oh, wow, it reacts way faster. Like, And that feeling is not something you probably can replicate on a bike that is just longer. It's longer for a reason because it's it's more stable. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm going to be the, the bad guy here and say spend your money. Okay. Without testing these two bikes, having not ridden either of them. When's that ever held us back? Uh, I'm just going to say that the, the Specialized will be stiffer. Like It will feel more, as you said, it will feel more responsive. It's going to feel stiffer. I think he should just change. Like if you're asking the question, you're already – Interested in doing it? I can. It's gonna be. It's gonna be better to ride, especially if you're like fairly quick and 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 if you're doing club rides and things with lots of acceleration, you're gonna enjoy this the raciness of the specialized SL7. Um, and like, I'm sorry, but like that Boardman's just not a it's not a good looking bike. I, I I wouldn't be that excited to get on it. I think the SL7's better looking. You'll in, It'll inspire you to. It will. I think the SL7 is sick. Yeah. It, it yeah. literally will. I, I, I would. I mean, yeah. I, I'd swap. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do, what I. I mean, so he's in the UK, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I'd keep both. That because it's got good um, frame clearance. It's got mud guard mounts. Just keep that as a winter bike. Like, if you can find just and keep because the wheels on. I, I don't know what wheels he's got on the Boardman, but like, ideally. That's a great point. Winter bike the Boardman yep. and see if you can build up. The yeah, because I've seen some super deals on some SRAM group sets recently. Because obviously, what's happening this year is they're trying to clear some stock out. Uh-huh. I, you you keep an eye out for a decent chance. I, I realize we're just upselling you, upselling so, you, upselling yeah. you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think you're right. I think you would be you'd be really well kept to keep that bike in in the UK and. Store your SL7 away for the. Well, summer especially months. because there's no resale value on a used Boardman frame. You, you're not going to get anything for that. Yeah, good point. So you, if you can manage financially, tr- just uh, try and hold on to it. I think. I just had a great idea for like a revenue stream for this show. Oh. So okay. what people do is they send in, should I upgrade <laughs> their bikes? And we do a whole bit. Okay. Where it's, oh, giving them rational reasons to to do it. Mm-hmm. We, but the the person sends us money to do it. And then they send the bit of us rationalizing the decision to their other half. And then they get to say, oh, but Jesse and Chris said that I should upgrade. <laughs> okay. Like if that, if that's worth something to you, uh, we're more than happy. <laughs> we can just, we could sit down and record like yeah. 30 of these in an yeah. afternoon. I think we, we can, can. And we'll pull all the stops too. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll go game changer. Yeah. We'll say what you're on's a dog of a bike. Dog I mean, bike. we'll pull all the one liners yeah. for you if, if that's what it's going to well, take. And if yeah. there's, there's a certain tiering to, oh, you know, how much okay. we, 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 we sort of emphasize, but yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you, BM, for, for that question this month. This week, we got sort of a bit... Does long- anyone disagree? Yeah, let us know. Like if you've oh. ridden... Is there someone out there that's ridden the Boardman SLR 9.2 disc and an specialized SL7? And can there'll be, there will be someone out of the 50,000 people that are listening to this, someone's got to have ridden both. Please comment in the on the YouTube video. Can I just quickly say, so we got over 40 questions this week. Um. We haven't quite worked this out, have we? <laughs> it's very <laughs> because ad hoc. <laughs> well, there's some great questions coming in. I know we're gonna. We, well, we did. We missed some this week, mm-hmm. so keep them coming in. Recency bias will always exist. So if you send them in on on a Monday, Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're probably more likely to to appear here as opposed to sending it in later in the week because we just will have seen it then. But yeah, please keep them coming in. It's been an awesome response. Quick bit of YouTube chat. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite. I love the YouTube chat section. <laughs> especially uh, especially when we talk about people we know. Tyler launched his or dropped his uh, Bolivia Death Road video this week. And I'm absolutely stoked to say that it blew up um, because it was, it was pretty legit. Um, yeah, so obviously I'll drop the links down below to that. And what's even more amazing is Jesse Coyle watched some of it, which is just shocking news to all of us. Um, <laughs> but what did, what did, yeah, I uh, mean, I, 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 here's, can I just quickly say something? Here's the thing with him. Okay. Like 
We're talking about VC Adventures, yes. previously called Vegan Cyclist. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, he's, he's nuts. We've said this a million times. And that's what's most entertaining about him when you watch him because that's who he comes across as on camera. And the better his stories, well, the, the films that he put up, puts up, the more ridiculous the scenario, the better they are. And that's the kind of harsh reality of it. But this, this kind of had me, I mean, I know he survived, but yeah, this was taking it right to the limit. So I'm at, I'm at 31 minutes and 41 seconds into the video. So I, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I, I got a gist of it. It's just a bit too long, but I'm at 31 minutes, 41, and he is, he's descending down a gravel road past a truck with a cliff on the side. I mean, this isn't, this isn't like YouTuber. No, it's just him. This is legitimately very dangerous. When he passes that truck, (laughs) I mean, he's blown cast an oncoming car. Like what, at what point do you just go? Not to mention the altitudes he's going to, if you're not prepared is also a very serious health risk, especially you're not just, doodling up there for a tourist that you're riding up there. I would implore you to watch the rest of the video because it does come back to bite him. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I didn't fully um, realise the the altitudes that he was going at, going to and riding to, and it really sent him into a spiral, basically. Um, Continued on and still somehow managed to get through the thing. But I I don't know, I just kind of wanted to say it because for me this went, Right to the edge of, like, adventure porn. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah. This is, re- I, okay, I can't, it's, I'm struggling I even watching this. I haven't seen anything really well. yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Just the, I don't know, I don't even, I just don't even know what to make of this video. Like, eh, the professionalism and the editing and the, the cinematics of it as a whole is, 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 is almost, it doesn't really feel like it belongs on YouTube. Yes, just as a starter, mm. and then just the 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 um the the, the lengths he's gone to danger wise to make it entertaining is uh yeah it's fucking crazy. It really <laughs> I, is. I, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really, I hope it pays off. But I see, like, man, that's. I'm really glad yeah. you mentioned the thing about it doesn't belong on YouTube. I mean, I had that chat with him when I was over there. I think it was part of the pod that I did with him, and he he did try and. He uh, proposed this to a lot of the other streaming services. You know, mm-hmm. this is the metrics on it. Look at the quality of it. You know, it's it's laughable the the budget that he was running for this particular series of things in comparison to what I know. You know, some of the GCM Plus films were made were made at, and you know, okay, they weren't on Netflix, but again, you know, that's that's probably where that sort of stuff deserves to be. But I just still look at it and go, how sustainable is this model of death defined? Literally, like, he calls the thing the death valley or the death road or whatever it is. Yeah. It is a fucking death road. Look at it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just, I don't, I almost don't want to give it too much kudos because I don't want him to go, yeah, God, the boys really liked it. I'm going to go yeah. right off the like, is this what it, Is this what it takes yeah. to have a sustainable YouTube uh, channel now is to. L- l- Literally risk life and limb. I mean, but I mean, damn, what a it's a what a film. I mean, it is. That's how you do it. Yep. If you're a cycling filmmaker, that's it's this as good as it gets. Where are you with e-bikes? E-bikes. Well, that's a big question. What type of e-bike are we talking? E-road bikes. I'm not. I'm not talking about commuting. I'm talking about fitness. Fitness e-biking. Is it a great inclusive way of broadening the reach of our marvellous, wonderful, happy sport? Or is it bullshit fake cyclists who have softened out and are missing the ethos of cycling, which is to suffer, and you need to earn every pedal stroke? I think they're – well, they're good. I mean, if you're – you know, 70 years old and starting to slow down a bit, but you want to go to the Dolomites to do a tour and it's going to take you three hours to get up, up Duez. 
that in the Dolomites? No. No. Okay. <laughs> you'd be you'd be going up the Stelvio in the Dolomites. <laughs> um, geez, that'd be a long ride, wouldn't it? Be a long ride. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if it's going to take you three hours to get up a climb in the Alps somewhere, uh, you're going to need an e-bike, and if that gets someone riding, it's fine. Do you want to go there? No, I. It's a similar line of the people that the riders that really get into the sport and treat it like uh, like they're into cars, like they're doing a car meetup where it's cycling is 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 about the gear and all the the chat and the froth of the stuff, not about actually riding. And that's so the e-bike has a potential to add to that too, because suddenly you can do the same rides but you don't have to ride as hard and you don't have to do as much training. And I feel sad because it's uh, cycling from a fitness point of view and health and there's a lot to get out of it from that. So if that's making e- it easier for the, the bike meetup frothers to then also have an easier way to just do these rides. And I just, the reason why, and people might say, well, why does it matter? They're still out there riding. I feel like those Types of riders are never in the sport for as long because they come in, they drop, yeah, maybe they're around for two years, they drop maybe 50K a year on various bits and bobs and then they move on to something else. And because there hasn't been a, a lifestyle thing, they haven't gotten the fitness benefits and the, the endorphins and all the things about being healthy and riding your bike hard, um, it, it makes this, I feel like it makes the sport less sticky. Yeah. I think there's. I think you're pretty much right. It's like it's like anything in cycling. There's there's a million niches to all of us. Just look at our comment section every week. You know, varying opinions on everything. It's awesome. Um, the niche of me in my 80s, who's been riding my whole life, but still wants to do a, a bobo loop and just can't. Shit, yeah. Put me on one. I'll ride up and do do whatever I can just to to say I've ridden up there. Happy days. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is a there is a niche that was invisible to me. In fact, it uh, was pointed out to me a little bit in the US because it's much bigger there. Like the road bike e biker is much much more of a thing, and the terrain is certainly around like California with the big canyons and that kind of stuff lends itself to more just being that that e biker. That particular person who's starting to sort of drop into the performance side of e-biking is very confusing to me. And this, this the performance well, side this, of e-biking. Yeah, well this I mean, there's, there's e-biking categories in in some of the races in the US. Okay. And I don't even I noticed I th- I messaged you about this the other week where I went out and did a couple of hours riding north and I had a look because you've got a KOM on a climb out there. Um no, Brooklyn KOM Brooklyn I think KOM. it was a, it was a seven 38, I think I did. I was 492 watts for that time. What was in the time Jan- again? In, it, was, it was on January <laughs> the 4th, 2023. It was seven minutes something, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I went, went down. Highlight and, of. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, high, high, yeah. Career highlight, <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously not. I'm not in that absolute, it, like stratosphere, but when you sort of put it down into like this year, February, I kind of had a look at the time that I did and I was like, oh, yeah, cool, in the top ten this year, happy days. And then I was looking at the names in front and we're in the cycling community so I do a little bit of looking around and four of the people in front of me had averaged less than 200 watts going up this climb. And I know there's light people in this world but yeah. people aren't that light. No. And that was – I was confused. I was like I was a bit of a dummy when I spoke to you about it. I'm like, what's going on with these times? Like these guys ride from like Taramara. It's like – they're doing a ride. It's not a car. I don't understand this. And you're like, oh no, they're on e-bikes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it is a whole. Yeah. It is a whole thing. Um, well, because they also won't unless they've taken a KOM, they won't get flagged because no one's going to go and find someone that got sixth on a segment and flag it. Whereas if you take the if you take twenty KOMs, it gets flagged straight away. But see, I would I I would be that dickhead who'd do that because like your KOMs and stuff and the actual real top ten is not realistic to me. What's realistic is I'd like to do like the best time this month or the top ten time this month. So for this next category of person down, mm. like, but I'm not going to do that. I feel like a tool. Like flagging someone's e-bike ride. 
maybe I'm 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 I'm, a, I'm sort of drawing a bridge that'll never be made. But let's say you, that C- California example when they go ride the canyons or, and, or, or things like that. What, what happens when the bunches that we used to when we got started in cycling would have joined become e-bike bunches, and then you're there on your road oh, bike, yeah. non-powered, and you're going, well, well, I don't really want to suffer around here at you know, for, for God knows how many hours, if everyone else is on e-bikes going faster and essentially having more fun, um, if, if that's what I could potentially start to see happening is you see a, you know, the group ride in a hilly area and if the majority of people just start being on uh, e-bikes, there'll be no more, you know, drag your ass around and don't eat enough and hit the wall and go through all that. You know, character building. The fun, the joy, yeah. yes. And then oh. you couple years on and you stick with it and you st- exercise regularly and suddenly then you you're just knocking them out on a Saturday morning like it's nothing. Like that's 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 the joy. The transition would never I mean, the transition to e bikes from someone who's been in the sport, like I know quite a few people, especially in the US who have done that. They're older now, they've had injuries and they they move into e biking. Great. All good. But the, I I don't reckon the transition ever goes the other way, which is someone gets into cycling by riding an e bike on the weekend. And then goes, you know what? I'm going to ditch the motor. I'm going to actually pedal up this hill. <laughs> I doubt that. But does that even matter? No, well, you know? is it um, – but I, I just don't know how many sort of riders between the age of sort of 20 and 50 that are sort of getting into cycling are on e-bikes. Like, I'm just not sure how big – I don't see it that often. So I'm, this is all kind of – I'm speculating. But – May, uh, yeah, I don't know what other people are seeing in other countries if that is if that is picking up. These e-bike bunches or just e-bike ri- road riders, if that's becoming a segment. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> I think we'll revisit that subject. I think we'll revisit it's it. It's still with very a, early days. Yeah, I, mean, I think we'll like, revisit it with a guest. I have that feeling. Uh, all right, JC, we, we will run. We are wearing Nero T-shirts, which Ooh. you can buy in the YouTube store. Um so I'm running, we're both running mediums, actually. I have tested, so I've washed both of these um, T-shirts to see if they had just ran completely in the wash. They're fine. Like, I'm not going to try and oversell you that this is. Well, they're not, put, in, they're not in stock, are they? It's a service that's shipping them to Correct. The people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, this is not couture. This is uh, – do you ever – they're Fruit of the Loom. Did you ever get Fruit of the Loom T-shirts I have kid? never heard of that before. Yeah. I, I remember I used to always – Fruit of the Loom was who actually made – Is that the, like AS Colour or yep. they do the yeah, blanks? Yeah, in the US. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's that quality and the, the screen printing's fine. It'll probably last you a year or two and then – pajamas after that i'm really selling them aren't i but they are they're, they're actually fine they're pretty good well it's easy i mean we're not going to go and order a order thing and hold it like mm. if you, yeah but people want to yeah if you want to get around it, it's, absolutely it's, yeah jump on board all right jc episode 71 in the books done Thanks. see you next week listen to us see you then <laughs> <laughs>